Hi everybody, and welcome to the first chapter of Heavy Metal in You by Christopher Crobaton. This is chapter one, Sabra Cadabra. Play. I'm afraid I'm going to start blathering in a couple of seconds. She gazed at me with a chin up, down her face look that said, I like it when you blather. You're wonderful, I blathered, throwing my hands down and avoiding her stare. You're just great, and I'm really nervous. And you've just been great, and I'm so sure I've blown tonight completely. And I'm sorry. And you're funny, and you're gorgeous, and I'm just so fucking amazed right now at how great you are. And I'm going to lose you. She did this thing where she leaned her weight onto one leg and kind of slouched, throwing her head back at a diagonal so that she was looking right down her face at me. It was like I was an eight ball and she was sizing me up for the crack. She'd been doing it all night and it was driving me nuts. She was sexy, not in an oversexed, flaunting it way, but in a cute, waiting-to-be-taken way. She was wearing an old blue nurse's uniform that she'd probably found at a Salvation Army store. That and the white garter belt stockings were not helping. I was completely drawn in. A smile crept across her perfect, wonderful lips. She slumped forward a little, shaking her head, breaking into a grin. Then she walked slowly over to me, threw her arms around my neck, and kissed me. It was perfect. I mean, absolutely perfect. Those full, rounded lips grasping mine. Tongue, but not too much. A flicker of hers. A split second of that soft, porous touch. We stood in the light of Central Park street lamp and kissed softly and carefully, both of us nervous as hell. Or maybe it was just me. My hands found their way around her waist, and I pulled her to me, her stomach against mine, her breasts pressing against my overcoat. This was what I wanted from the night. She was what, I wa what I'd been looking for. I pulled my head back a little and whispered, Um, okay. She cut me off with another kiss. Rewind. She'd shown up exactly on time. The smoky little cafe I'd picked her fi picked had fancy-looking food and attractive waiters in clean uniforms, but also had wooden tables with writing scratched into them and old black-and-white movie posters on the walls. I thought it suited her. I had been keeping my, the name in my head so that when I finally got the courage up to ask, out a play, uh, ask her out at play rehearsal, it would seem like I had at least some sort of taste or culture or brain. I'd spent all afternoon going out over how awkward this was going to be, the dark and stormy actor and the chipper lighting girl stuck in a stuffy little room with nothing to say to each other. The outfit had floored me. She obviously knew how to impress a guy like me, and that made me so happy I'd wanted to scream. But it was her. It was her hair. It was the sort of halo she seemed to give off. I wanted... I wanted so badly. She'd walked over, sat down, and chirped. Hey. Hey, how was your day? She smiled. Good. What'd you do? Looked forward to this. Wham. I swallowed what felt like a ball of light. Oh. What about you? Um, you know, about the same. She laughed. <laughs> Good talk slowly turned small, with us throwing back and forth witty commentary about school and idiot banter about everything else. It became obvious that we were both freaking out just a wee bit, and the massive mugs of highly caffeinated mud we were slurping down weren't helping in the least. Finally, after a mug and a biscotti each, I looked up to ask what she wanted to do, and found she was staring at me down her face. I managed to ask her why she was staring at me, and her mouth curled up at the corners like the Grinch when he got a wonderful, awful idea. We just stared at each other for about fifteen minutes, 
and even when the waitress asked us if we wanted the check, I managed to pay for the whole thing without once breaking my gaze from hers. Finally. Okay, really. What are you looking at? You. I'm a little nervous. Yeah. A pause. Let's go for a walk in the park, okay? I was hoping you'd say that. Play. We must have spent at least half an hour standing there in each other's arms, just making out in the park. The cold didn't really matter. Neither did the condescending glances from the strangers passing by. One guy even had the gall to mutter, get a room, under his breath. Any other circumstances, I would have gone running after him with my middle finger raised, but I didn't. I just held her and kissed her and was momentarily content. Finally, I killed the mood by pulling back and saying that I had to get home early. She yanked me towards the street, and we spilled out into Central we Park West, heading across town towards my home, stopping occasionally for a kiss or two or several more. We were generally silent, maybe a word or two passing between us. We didn't need to say anything. We were fine as it is. She dropped me off across the street from my place around 11.30. I held her close and kissed her one last time before running to catch the light. I wanted to dance, sing, throw my arms in the air, and fly away on the cold night sky. She was great. I'd made a catch. Hell, I'd made the catch. I was a friggin' god. I unlocked my front door and skipped up the stairs onto my foyer, humming a morbid angel tune under my breath. My family lived in a brownstone house of, on the Upper West Side. My folks made quite a bit of money, so my brother, sister, and I were always provided for. We were fortunate, well-raised kids, and I was a friggin' god, apparently. Before retiring for the evening, I kissed my mom goodnight and told Erica, my sister, to turn down her damn bubblegum pop. The night had been perfect. Perfect. But it was missing something. Flicking through the pages of my CD binder, I found what I craved so badly. A little Celtic frost, maybe some misfits, and a lot of typo-negative. I pushed Morbid Tales, Famous Monster, and Bloody Kisses into my stereo and pressed play. Rewind. I was in the car with my family, driving to some family function. One of my uncles was getting married or something, and it seemed like a garish waste of my precious time. I was somewhere between eight and ten, and my bro brother was discovering this crazy thing called rock and roll, constantly gabbing about some bald idiot named Billy Corgan, while we waited for our dad to finish playing from paying for the unleaded. Carver leaned forward and turned on the radio. Oh my god, I thought, listening to the sounds blasting from our car. Oh my god, what is this? A wall of electronic sound came rushing out, washing over me with so much atmosphere and power that my preteen mind was blown away. My eyes went wide as I asked my mom to turn it up even more, fascinated by the voices coming out of the speakers on my side. This was insane. There was some lunatic on the radio screaming something at the top of his lungs about a head being like a hole and something else about bowing down and getting what you deserve. What did that mean? What was this guy singing about? Was he really singing? Was it even a he? And what godforsaken instruments created the beautiful noise backing him up? The car's stereo immediately became Linda Blair and the Exorcist to me, fi frightening and thralling and undoubtedly cool. Yeah, Nine Inch Nails are okay, sighed Carver, slumping back in his seat, but not as good as the pumpkins. I didn't listen. I was so enraptured by the musical, musical darkness filling me, a noise that in time seemed like sounds of war against all things good, the soundtrack to a temple being burned to the ground. Pause. My music was my goddamn life, or most of it anyway. Honest. My life had a soundtrack at all times, and that soundtrack was 100% grade A metal. Sure, I listened to lots of different things, a little punk, a little pop, even a little country, but metal was everything to me. At any hour in which I could get away with it, I was blasting Exodus on my stereo or slamming my head to 
Dimmu Borgir with my headphones on. My teeth were nice commodities, and I did enjoy having kidneys, but I'd give them all away if someone threatened to take my Slayer albums from me. Heavy metal is like that. Your music defines you to the point where you need it. You don't own an article of clothing without a band logo on it, and your room is plastered with posters of your favorite bands because you need all of that fed into you. I was heavy metal. It mattered to me more than anything. Well, then there was this girl, Melissa, the goddess I'd just left. She mattered, too. Play. I flopped down on my beanbag chair and listened. Sure enough, a chorus of harmonized screams flowed, flooded out of my speakers, followed by a round of cult necro-thrash. Celtic Frost, Morbid Tales. Excellent album. Dark, melodic thrash, with enough sheer unholiness to snap your puny head off your neck. I nestled my head into the beanbag and let the music wash over me. She was fucking amazing. She was beautiful and wonderful, and I was a god. Into the crypt of rays! Tonight was perfect. Christ, she was incredible. Into the crypt of rays! The night had to be ended right then, I decided, on a good note. I picked up my body, dragged it to the bathroom, getting it undressed, and finally plopping it down onto my bed. Sleep was quick to approach. It had been a long week and a great Saturday night. Rest was in order. I flicked my stereo remote, shutting the music down in the middle of procreation of the wicked. My eyes went heavy, and my mind began to wander. She's great. She's everything I've wanted for a long time. Her tongue and her face and those eyes and... I passed out, tired, with frost lyrics and a wonderful girl rushing across my frontal lips. Thanks, guys. I hope you enjoyed the first chapter. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.